Okay, so my project is on bioengineered tissue construct for knee meniscus repair. Um, so we know that the meniscus are these C-shaped fibrocartilaginous structures in the knee and they're responsible for carrying the majority of the load. So a healthy meniscus is really important for functioning of the knee joint in general and to protect the underlying cartilage. In fact, uh, meniscus damage is a precursor to OA and also meniscus tears are the most common type of traumatic knee injury. So clearly this is a um, clinical problem and treatment options that are available right now have high midterm failure rates and secondary OA is common. And in the worst case scenario, joint replacement surgery is necessary. So there's a clinical need to provide a new solution that offers long-term advantages to the patient. And our goal is to develop this new long-lasting um, treatment strategy for defect repair using a functional tissue engineering approach. So we've developed um, what we call a bottom-up, iterative, computationally assisted method to dividing, designing a construct. So any computer model is dependent on robust input. So what we first need to do is characterize the tissue to develop structure function relations for human meniscus tissue. And then from that, we can develop our new computational model and identify what are the critical structural and functional parameters that should be included in the design. We can then design a construct and virtually assess its functionality using our computer model. We then ask ourselves, does this construct recapitulate human tissue? If the answer is no, we can then use our model to identify what are the critical parameters that we need to fine tune and start the process again until we get an answer of yes, in which case we can move to the bench top and do cell seeding in our ex vivo model. So as I mentioned, the first step is tissue characterization. So we want to look at mechanical, electrochemical, and transport properties, of which there's very little quantitative information in the literature right now. Once we have that information, we can build our computational model, which will be based on mechanoelectrochemical mixtures theory. So the important thing about this model is we can look at different scaffold design parameters and see how does each parameter contribute to the functionality of the scaffold, and if we change one, what happens? Um, and we can assess that virtually. Once we're happy with our design, we move to the bench top, like I said, and we'll uh, make a construct using electrospun fibers that are derived from decellularized meniscus. So we'll build our scaffold, assess it, see if we like what we're seeing, if not, redesign it again. Once we're happy, we can seed cells and then put it in our ex vivo defect model. And at each step, we want to compare this with a commercially available system, and we think that we'll be able to provide better results. So at each step in our process, we have significant scientific and um, translational outcomes, which include um, this new gold standard set of data that can be used to design um, new constructs and a new tool. And most importantly, we believe that with this system, we'll be able to achieve better integration and regeneration of the meniscus, and which will in turn lead to reduced OA in the knee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me here. My name is Xue Ying. I work in Biomechanics Lab with Dr. Huang. My today's talk is about the energy metabolism of intervertebral disc cells. In the vertebral disc sitting in between the vertebral body of the spine, it transmits loads and confers spine flexibility. It can be visually divided into two regions, the central nucleus porosis region, which is gel-like, and the surrounding uh, fib fibrosis, annual fibrosis uh, tissues. Um, the, two phenotype, the two regions differ in their cell phenotypes and extracellular matrix components, which are mainly protein glycan and uh, collagen. So IOD generation is associated with low back pain, which has an incident rate of 1.39 per 1,000 people each year in the U.S. 10% of the sufferers eventually develop the clock disability. So IOD degeneration, the exact reason is unknown, but um, the several factors have been identified to, to be associated with them, such as loading, trauma, aging. Among them, nutrition plays a major role. IVD is avascular because of that, it can only get nutrition from the periphery and the, the top and bottom end play area from the blood vessels. Um, they uh, mainly use glycolysis and their en as their en major energy source. Uh, IVD degeneration is characteristic by the uh, loss of mitochondrial NP cells in the center and their ability to produce protein glycan. 
and subsequent loss of the hydration and tissue loss lead to the stiffness of IVD. Because of that, the biological repair of IVD aims to restore the IVD cells' ability to reproduce uh, their extracellular matrix components, mainly protein glycan, as this protein can absorb water and pressurize in response to pressure. So um, we already know the low nutrition in terms of low glucose and glucose supply are detrimental to IVD cells' metabolism. In addition, um, the ECM production of the cells are known to be related to their intracellular, intracellular energy levels. Because of that, um, the, we also know ATP is the building block of protein glycan. So in this study, we investigate the interrelationship between the ATP and protein glycan synthesis of IVD cells under the altered glucose and oxygen environment. So we harvest the IVDs from the pig and cut the cells into the uh, 3D agarose gel modes uh, to keep the their phenotypes, 3D phenotypes, followed by six days of incubation under the oxygen level 21% and 5% in a sequential reduction of glucose starting from one gram per liter, which is five millimolar. We found in this study that um, actually a threshold glucose value, which is 2.5 millimolar, uh, is, a, is a key glucose level that below this level, not quarter NP cells, um, its ability to produce protein glycan is hampered. Also, not quarter NP cells and AF cells respond differently to alter nutri nutrition environment in terms of ATP and protein glycan production. So um, targeting their intracellular ATP level may help <laughs> targeting the boosting their ability to reproduce protein glycan. Thank you. Hi. So normally people take for granted if you need energy, you need uh, nutrients for your body to keep functioning. You just eat and that's it. People that suffer from type 1 diabetes actually can take this for granted. Um, the cells in the pancreas, more specifically the beta cells, produce a hormone called insulin that allows the rest of the cells in your body to obtain the nutrients from the food you're eating and use it as energy. In the case of people with type 1 diabetes, these cells are being destroyed. The worst part of it is that they're being destroyed by the immune system. The immune system is that part that's supposed to be protecting you from getting sick is actually attacking you and making you sick. The, the cells that end up going to your pancreas and attacking the beta cells are called our reactive T cells. And before they actually go and attack, they have to travel through an, orga, through an organ called the lymph node. The lymph node has a really standard structure and uh, inside it there's a group of cells that form this network or reticulum called fibroblastic reticular cells. It has been shown that these cells are affected not only in type 1 diabetes, but other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. The issue with studying these cells is, specifically in type 1 diabetes, we can just take the pancreatic lymph node and study it without altering the cells a lot. My question, the question that I ask myself is, can we mimic this structure to have a more relevant way of studying these cells in vitro? The way I'm trying to do this is by isolating these cells. So I take the lymph nodes from both, let's say, healthy and diabetic or diseased mice. I get rid of all the rest of the cells, and I only have the cells that form this reticulum, called the fibroblastic reticular cells. And developing my own collagen scaffolds, for example, a collagen sponge, I can mimic this sort of uh, reticulum or network, and sitting these cells on top of this, we can create a tool to study how these cells behave, how they interact with our reactive T cells, so we're basically developing a tool or a library of tools because by uh, modifying the collagen uh, scaffold, we can have different pore size and different structures. We develop a tool to study fibroblastic reticular cells, not only in diabetes, but also other autoimmune diseases. And in the end, this tool can not, it doesn't have to be used only by biomedical engineers, but also immunologists and clinical doctors. Okay, so most of you have heard of type 1 diabetes and may even know someone that's affected by this disease. So it's a highly investigated disease, yet it remains an unmet clinical challenge. This image is supposed to represent the prevalence of type 1 diabetes, and it doesn't discriminate between age or gender or ethnicity. And it highlights the point that it is one of the largest medical and socioeconomic burdens that we face until a cure is actually established. So as healthy individuals, 
Um, and Freddie did a really great job on describing the pathogenesis of the disease, so I won't beat a dead horse. Um, but basically, when type 1 diabetes occurs, there's an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells within the pancreatic islets, which are a bundle of cells. And together, um, without these beta cells, we have uh, the, we don't maintain our blood levels, like our blood glucose levels, that is. Um, so the current strategies for therapies and maintenance of blood glucose levels right now are is um, the exogenous insulin that patients become dependent on. There's other supplements and dietary regulation. However, none of these are able to actually prevent long-term complications. So the Diabetes Research Institute here at UM has a large initiative that drives leading edge approaches to curing type 1 diabetes. And this is by ongoing trials where they use cell replacement therapies where they introduce a donor's uh, pancreatic islets to the actual type 1 diabetic patients. Now this may seem really straightforward, however, uh, there are many limitations to this approach. It's on the leading edge cusp of medicine where this can provide a potential cure. So in order for us to overcome many of these limitations, we're proposing a modeling uh, of islet transplantation. And I'm also, as a stem cell biologist, proposing the use of mesenchymal stem cells to be added to the transplant of pancreatic islets to improve many of these things that uh, could help optimize this transplantation process. Um, in order for us to have a long-term viable function of the pancreatic islets, there are many things that we need to overcome. So we need uh, to find the right transplantation site. These pancreatic islets require high levels of oxygen, and they need to be closely associated to the bloodstream or the vasculature. Therefore, integration with the surrounding vasculature is a critical process, and this is called vasculogenesis. Um, another big limitation is how the patient's immune system will actually accept the graft. So fortunately, with the addition of mesenchymal stem cells, these cells are unique and they maintain homeostasis, so they're capable of promoting an anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, and even a vasculogenic effect when introduced to this system. So using this lab on chip devices and in vitro platforms, such as this model for transplantation, allows for pertinent tissues and cellular components to be evaluated with ease of sampling and high throughput analyses, and ultimately address the evaluation. So let me go through this quickly since I'm running out of time, but we have preliminary results to show that with islets alone, which is the current strategy, or what's called a heterotopic islet spheroid, which introduces the stem cells and also endothelial cells, we can add this to the transplantation site, which is our vascular bed, and we can start to see some small improvements. This is the islets alone, and then here is what we have when we actually have the heterotopic islet spheroid that's mediated with the stem cells. Thank you. Hi everybody, have you ever heard of aminodosis? I'm sure that most of you know Alzheimer's disease, which is the most frequent type of aminodosis in humans. Cardiac aminodosis is a myocardial disease, which is caused by the deposition of abnormal proteins in the extracellular tissues of heart tissue. Uh, main consequence of this uh, disease is uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, leading to progressive heart failure. Uh, Repeat disease progression, uh, poor diagnosis rate, uh, and uh, reduced therapeutic options uh, makes cardiac amniodesis management difficult. It is important to understand the mechanism of this uh, disease in order to identify and develop therapeutic strategies. However, current planar static culture systems and animal models have limitations such as cells cultured in vitro do not function like human bodies and animal studies take years to complete. Uh, these uh, limitations highlight the urgent need for a in vitro cardiac disease model. Uh, engineered cardiac tissue, uh, engineering tissues, uh, macro-engineered tissues can be a solution for, to this problem uh, with their capability to uh, include macro uh, fabrication and microfluidic technologies. Among them, heart on a chip uh, is a uh, unique device designed to decapitate macro environment and uh, physiological function of heart tissue. In uh, with this heart on a chip system, cardiac monolayers can be grown in uh, in a macro environment, which mimics the realistic physiological system in heart tissue. 
Um, <clears throat> Here you see a histopathology image of a uh, cardiac amniotesis patient. Amniot deposits disrupt organization of the heart muscle. In this study, our goal is to uh, mimic this uh, amniot deposits uh, disrupted organization of the heart muscle by uh, combining biomaterials and the organ on a chip technology. Uh, up to now, we produce gelatin hydrogel to mimic the extracellular matrix of heart tissue and we performed mechanical, chemical, and physical characterization of this hydrogel. In the future, our goal is to investigate the interaction between the uh, amnoid peptide and the gelatin hydrogel, and then engineer cardiac monolayers on these amnoid peptide deposited gelatin hydrogels. Finally, we will collect and analyze electrical readouts from engineered cardiac tissues with this model. We expect that the results obtained from this study will enable us to understand the uh, mechanism of this disease pathogenesis, which will help us to develop uh, treatment strategies in the future. Thank you. Okay, so hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to be presenting for the Biomaterials Laboratory. Uh, so this is a shared space between Photos Andropoulos and myself. And we had to give it a title, so we decided to call it Biomaterial Development for Vascular Tissue Engineering because we do focus on proangiogenic therapies. Um, so basically, a bird's eye view of what we do, we first start uh, with a, a, a biomaterial selection. So we select a proper biomaterial, and then we modify it uh, to, ha to render it more adequate uh, characteristics for the intended purpose. Um, here's an example of a polyethylene glycol-based um, uh, polymer that was modified with nitrosinamyl chloride in order to render it gelation capabilities under exposure of a certain uh, wavelength and it could revert back to it at its accurate state uh, when it's exposed uh, to a different uh, wavelength as well. We then combine this, once we're, we're happy with what we got, um, we combine this with uh, drug delivery capabilities. Uh, so we introduce bioactive molecules in order to enhance its effect on the target tissue. Um, and finally, uh, what we do is we utilize different scaffold fabrication techniques to introduce uh, architectural cues which will further enhance uh, tissue, tissue regeneration for the target uh, areas. Um, so here's an example of a freeze-drying uh, scaffold fabrication technique. Uh, but we focus mainly on nanofibrous-based uh, scaffolds, uh, in particular those that are uh, produced via the electrospinning process. And the reason uh, is we've been doing this for about 10 years, so a whole decade uh, with electrospinning. Um, and it's, it's, it's very attractive uh, for two main reasons. First, it has unprecedented surface area to volume ratios and it can introduce both nano as well as micro architectural cues which has been shown to enhance uh, the, the reaction of the tissue, right? So again, we saw a good success with uh, the hydrogels that we chose, the biomaterials that we chose as drug delivery vehicles and we further enhance that by introducing architectural cues um, with the specific uh, fabrication technique of electrospinning. Thank you. So the retina, it's part of the central nervous system. It's a, it's a very complex structure composed of several retinal layers that are uh, cells that are connected with each other. Uh, in the retina, the light uh, goes through several, goes through a photoreceptors and then here um, it is uh, transduced into electrical signals that are then transmitted to the brain, making the retina a very important element in the visual pathway. Because of the cells in the retina do not regenerate, uh, the degener de degeneration of one or several of the retinal layers can cause loss of vision and blindness. Conditions such as glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration are one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide. In the case of, of uh, glaucoma, the cells that are affected are retinal ganglion cells. And in the case of uh, age-related macular degeneration, we have the pigmented epithelial cells that are affected. Not only we have degeneration, but also tumors in the, in the retina that also could lead to uh, impairments in the normal function of the retina. Conditions such as retinoblastoma, it's a tumor that is present in, in children 
uh, and it is uh, caused by a mutation in the retinoblastoma gene. Uh, in order for us to understand more about these diseases and to be able to tackle them, we have developed a patient-specific approach in which we take a patient sample, and in this case, we take cells from a dental pulp, and we reprogram them into induced pluripotent stem cells. iPSCs are cells that are somatic in origin, and then after reprogramming, they express characteristics of embryonic stem cells. So we use these cells to create these organoids that are capable of differentiating into every single type of, cell, of uh, cells in the retina in a very stratified order, mimicking, the, mimicking the, how it happens in vivo. So this model can give us an insight in the early stages of development and very, um, more understanding of what's going on in retinal differentiation. Furthermore, with the use of uh, gene editing tools such as CRISPR, we have been able to have a, a, ret a retinal organoid that has a knockout for retinoblastoma gene uh, so that we can have a model to understand how this tumor progresses and how it develops in the, in the retina. And then because we know that these uh, in the retinal organoids were capable of getting all of the different cells of the retina, we can isolate specific cells of our interest is the retinal ganglion cells, which is one of the cells that are uh, degenerated during glaucoma. And then we can use these cells to understand what happens in this disease. We can understand, uh, we can study uh, drug uh, toxicity, and also in the future, uh, see if we can use these cells for implanting them back into the patient, and then we can close the loop from patient-specific modeling and then uh, implanting them back into the patient. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Wyndham Batchelor and we are working on developing a novel uh, glaucoma model using AFM nanolithography. So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma, glaucoma is an, uh, a disease of the eye that leads to optic nerve degeneration and retinal ganglion cell death. Glaucoma affects around 60 million people worldwide making it the number one cause of irreversible visual impairment. Um, the retinal ganglion cells, as Zenith mentioned, are an inner layer of your retina that receives information from your photoreceptors and transmits this information through your optic nerve to your eye. Uh, with elderly populations around the globe skyrocketing, uh, glaucoma is poised to become an even bigger burden to society than it already is. Once these retinal ganglion cells die, vision is lost permanently. So. Right now, um, there are several treatments that can be used to slow the progression of glaucoma. Uh, intraocular pressure lowering drugs, which uh, uh, intra that high intraocular pressure is one of the main drivers of glaucoma, so these lower the pressure to reduce the damage, as well as laser treatments and shunts. However, these treatments suffer in many ways. They can only uh, lower the intraocular pressure, which only slows the progression of the disease. Many people will still continue on to um, lose vision even with these treatments, and it does nothing to restore vision already lost or any damage done by glaucoma. So in, in the future, cellular therapies and regenerative medicine is needed to actually um, restore these retinal ganglion cells um, to the eye. But so far, progress in developing these treatments have been slowed by lack of a suitable glaucoma model. Right now, mice and other laboratory animals are used, and these don't really mimic well the complex pathogenesis of glaucoma. Uh, nor are they a very suitable environment for doing experiments because there's a lot of uh, noise that gets conflated with signal and it's hard to isolate different factors in, um, in uh, these experiments. So what we propose is using atomic force microscopy nanolithography to build a novel in vitro human glaucoma model. We plan to use two different modalities, dip pen nanolithography, which uh, puts material on a surface, and scratch nanolithography, which removes uh, tissue, or remo removes material on a collagen gel scaffold to uh, enhance a scaffold with um, mechanical, topological, and chemical cues. Um, and then we will put RGCs on the scaffold to simulate the RGC layer, and then we will subject this to high pressure and record responses to see how well our model simulates glaucoma. Thank you. As a friend, it's always, a good, it's always good advice to, to always read the fine print. But today, I'm actually going to tell you why you can't always read the fine print. 
I want you to do me a favor. Take a look at the palm of your hand. Nobody's doing it, but I'm serious. Now take a look at me. The ability to focus between distant and near objects is called accommodation. And the way that happens is the, the muscle that holds the lens in place contracts and relaxes, allowing the lens to, stick, to change shape. While it's easy for everyone in the room under 35 to accommodate, as you get older, it becomes more difficult for this process, and you can no longer read anything that's near. And as a result, you can't read the fine print anymore. In fact, 99% of the world's population will require, to ha or will require some form of corrective lenses by age 50 because of presbyopia. But if all you need are some glasses, then why are we here? Glasses don't actually restore accommodation. Instead, you actually have to remove your glasses in order to change focus or use a solution that you, where you lose the peripheral vision. And some jobs require more flexibility than having that solution. But before we can come up with a solution for restoring accommodation, we have to first understand why does the lens ability, why does the lens lose the ability to change shape? Is it because that the lens becomes too hard, or is it because the ciliary muscle becomes too weak? I'm a part of a team of scientists that uses an array of methods to ask questions like, why, what's going on with the lens? And in 2012, we created the first system in the world that visualizes the path of light to the whole eye. And yeah, we're still really excited about that. <laughs> we took that system and we used it on, diff on people of different ages to take snapshots of the lens. And as you can imagine, that's a whole lot of data. It's my job to take those beautiful images and turn it into, whole, into hard, cold facts. But I just really need some numbers like curvatures and distances and stuff like that. And it's not as sexy as a bionic eye with a laser option. But imagine what your raw data does in, in a search engine. It creates personalized results. But our results won't harass you. Instead, we use them to answer fundamental questions. We also use it to validate the method of restoring accommodation so that we can create more than just generic solutions. We want to create personalized ones. So our exciting advancements in our research have allowed us to be the first people to be able to image, to catch the lens in action, essentially. We can image the lens as you accommodate. And now, we can also quantify it. It brings us one step closer to understanding why you no longer accommodate and how can we restore accommodation. So although today you can't, you'll never always be able to read the fine print, hopefully when you retire at 40 as a millionaire, you'll have the option to. Remember, that's what friends are for. <laughs> All right, so I'm a new faculty in BME, and um, today I just wanted to go over with you kind of what my lab is focusing on. And so in my lab, as we're in the neural section, we focus on neural tissue engineering. So I'm interested in building and bridging new connections within the nervous system, particularly following an injury. So when we think of injuries to the nervous system, they can come in a, in a couple of different ways. You have peripheral nerve injuries, so kind of more your sensory and your motor neurons. Um, as well as the central nervous system, so your brain and your spinal cord. And if we take all these together, it accounts for over uh, several hundred thousand um, injuries sustained each year. And that's on top of the injuries that people are already living with every single day. And this results in uh, lifetime paralysis. So to me, I like to kind of reframe it a little bit and think of it as a quality of life issue and a life-threatening issue, right? So quality of life issue are those neurons that are going to your muscles and they're impacting your ability to get around. And whereas if you think a bit more big, a bit more uh, large scale, you also have neurons that are going in your spinal cord to your major organs. So if you have a spinal cord injury, let's say, um, and it's affecting your neurons that are going to your heart or your blood vessels or your lymphatic system, you're going to have a lot of complications which can be life-threatening down the road. So this is really kind of a long-term um, goal to try to address these issues. So in my lab, we use a variety of methods in order to try to rebuild these structures and connect the uh, neurons that have essentially been severed. So one of the primary ways that my lab does this is through the development of new biomaterials. So how can we bridge one end of that nerve to the other end? in order to try to regrow the tissue 
Um, additionally, we look at uh, how these materials are affecting the neurons in a culture. But we're not just interested in neurons, right? So in your uh, central nervous system in particular, there's a variety of cells that are present. So we're also interested in the support cells. So if you have a spinal cord injury, your vasculature is also going to be damaged. So we need to take this into account when we're building new materials. And once we finally have some materials that we're confident in, we begin to test these in animals. And in particular, my lab uses genetically engineered mouse models because we can tell exactly which types of neurons um, and nerve tracts we're restoring. But more importantly, and a little bit more near and dear to my heart, are neural stem cells. So how can we repopulate the tissue in order to rebuild what we've lost, um, as well as using various gene therapies. So trying to bring this all together to develop a more robust solution to nerve injury and hopefully restore some of the uh, lost function um, and limit paralysis in the population. So with that, that's it. Hi, so I work in the inner ear, and the inner ear houses two incredible sensory systems. We have the auditory system, or hearing, which is responsible for our ability to communicate with others. Why so? Okay. So you can hear me. Our, our ability to communicate with others, as well as enjoy things such as music. And then we have another system, which is maybe less known, but equally as important, the vestibular system, which is responsible for our ability to balance and orient ourselves in space. We're wrong way. Okay, so this is just a summary of the inner ear, and right here you can see the two systems are right next to each other. We have the spiral organ, which is the cochlea responsible for hearing, and right next door we have the semicircular canals responsible for the balance part of the vestibular system. Um, so these two systems we are using constantly, every single day, yet sometimes we may take them for granted, especially if something goes wrong. So my lab, the Sensory Electrophysiology Lab in the Biomedical Engineering, also works with the Inner Ear Institute on the medical campus. We looked for protection and restoration of the hearing and balance functions in these two systems. So we have two ongoing projects. The first project is working in the auditory system, where we're using therapeutic hyperthermia to protect against uh, trauma in the inner ear, specifically the cochlea. Trauma can be introduced uh, several ways. We can have acu acoustic trauma, for example, if you're sitting uh, in the front row of a rock show. Or uh, for physical trauma, for example, if you insert a cochlear implant into your cochlea. These traumas can cause irreversible damage in the cells that are responsible for hearing. And our lab is using uh, modeling to look at these, these traumas and see if we can use different therapies to protect them. For example, hypothermia. So we're developing models and systems that hopefully can be used on the bedside and in the OR. And then the second part of um, our lab looks at the vestibular system. So this is what I'm working on in my PhD. I'm specifically using infrared radiation or light as a stimulation technique in the vestibular system to look at the interaction between the vestibular system and um, blood pressure and heart rate. So maybe this is something everybody can relate to. For example, you're fumbling around in the dark in the middle of the night trying to go to the bathroom and you feel this as you arise from your bed, you feel this, this sudden drop in blood pressure or heart rate or you get dizzy. Well, the vestibular system needs uh, in input from the visual system and I'm looking at this pathway with infrared radiation. So I actually, as you can see, am able to evoke a blood pressure and heart rate changes with infrared radiation of the vestibular system. Now this change in blood pressure and heart rate might be crucial for somebody of older age that could actually pass out or fall or uh, anything worse. So we're looking at this pathway and we're looking at the neural anatomy of this pathway to see where it is in the brain in order to investigate and hopefully use this research and this technology um, to, uh, to help the, these patients and possibly develop a prosthetic of the vestibular system in the future. Um, so this is my lab and I just want to thank my lab and the collaborators and we have the funding below. Uh, thank you. So uh, again, my research is in two areas, data analytics and bioinformatics. In the morning I talked about some of our work in um, data analytics, so now I'm going to talk about the piece of work uh, uh, in uh, bioinformatics. So we know cancer is a, a genetic disease right, caused by mutations in genes or dysregulation of thousands of gene expression and also some uh, uh, aberrant epigenetic changes. Now, uh, if in a tumor, then this, uh, we found that in a tumor, typically there are thousands of mutations. And uh, thousands of genes, they are dysregulated. The question is really which genes or, 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 or which kind of changes drive the development of a cancer. So, so identify 
this cancel drive gene is very important, obviously, to understand the molecular mechanism of cancer development, to find biomarkers for cancer diagnosis, to discover therapeutic uh, target. Right? So now, uh, so we, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our work on called DNA methylation. So uh, we know DNA molecules consist of four nucleotides. Now, one nucleotide uh, called cytosome can be methylated. And uh, people found that in human tumors undergo massive uh, changes in DNA methylation. This can silence uh, tumor suppressor genes, activate oncogenes to cause cancer. So really, we want to know what genes really cause this massive DNA uh, 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 um, uh, dysregulation in the in methylation. So uh, we got a data set from the DNA methylation data from uh, uh, we call the, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, Database. Uh, that's the breast cancer uh, uh, tumors and also some normal uh, uh, tissues. And we got rna uh, gene expression data. We got the DNA motif data. And then we develop a computational pipeline. Uh, we do this uh, first uh, data processing, and then we identify that uh, uh, differentially methylated regions, and then we find uh, those DNA mo uh, 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 motif that protein can bind into these uh, motifs. Uh, and uh, potentially, this DNA, uh, this protein binding to these motifs cause, you know, uh, 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 methylation changing. And then, uh, after we find those uh, binding proteins, we correlate the expression of those protein or those genes with the methylation level. So eventually, we find a set of uh, 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 genes, we, we found a set of uh, uh, 698 genes that potentially cause, uh, you know, uh, a methylation dysregulation. Then we did a, a network analysis. We found that a lot of actually the cancer gene, known cancer gene, are involved in this, uh, the, the genes that we identified. So this set of genes basically provide the biomarkers and therapeutic targets uh, for breast cancer that result in a paper just published this month. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my uh, research in general is on uh, nanophotonics that deals with the uh, nanotechno uh, nanomaterials and nanostructures interactions with light. So today we have a project related to biomedical uh, application, uh, a sensing platform. Here, uh, there are many people working on uh, different sensor technologies, so the handheld uh, level notch type sensors, implantable sensors, wearable sensors. We focus on the uh, handheld device uh, uh, based uh, sensors and more importantly in these kind of sensors uh, the transducer technology is very important. Transducer convert the uh, chemical or biological uh, interactions into the electrical or optical signals. So we mainly focus on uh, highly sensitive and accurate and also robust uh, technology for uh, uh, efficient transducers. So some of the uh, candidates for transducer, one of them is uh, uh, one of the technologies to localize surface plasma resonance. It occurs when you have uh, metallic nanoparticles such as gold and silver, uh, depending on their size, volume, shape, and also the surrounding uh, medium, they change uh, their colors, which means they observe different light. Uh, so we use the kind of property because when, uh, when they, the molecules attaches on the surface, they change their color. Another one is called the photonic band of structure. Uh, it's a kind of uh, periodic optical nanostructure and changes the optical property. You can find uh, this in nature, uh, like the, you know, the, some pieces, uh, species of the butterfly wings, they have different colors based on the nanostructures. And also the chameleon, they change their body color using this uh, photonic band gap. So we make uh, artificial uh, photonic band gap to use the sensors. So here I want to introduce about the uh, surface plasma based uh, sensors. So we use uh, gold nanoparticles and also the micro uh, device here called the field effect transistor. We combine these two and make a new functional device called plasma field effect transistor. So this plasma field effect transistor converts the plasma energy into the electrical signal. At the same time, it amplifies the signal. So we have a better sense of signal from the device. So in this uh, figure, uh, it shows uh, kind of uh, the uh, device structure, which is uh, incorporated into the, uh, on the uh, active layer of the device. And we have a microscopic uh, picture of the device and also a SCM picture that shows the cold nanoparticles on, this, uh, on the device. So we make a sensor using the fluidic channel, and also the sensors are integrated inside the channel. 
and as, as you should see here, this is kind of cartoon that shows that. And this, these are kind of prototype sensors. Uh, in one inch by one inch uh, uh, glass wafer, we have more than 100 sensors integrated. And then this shows a small sensors inside the microfluidic channel. Uh, so we are able to detect the uh, real-time sensor binding, uh, if, I mean the molecular binding uh, from the sensor, and we also demonstrated it's much better than current existing optical technology, and successfully demonstrated um, the uh, cancer biomarker and also heart attack biomarker uh, using whole blood. Yeah, that's it. So hello everyone, my name is Jun Zaharias from the School of Business, and I'm very excited to share with you uh, my, latest, my latest research. So how many of you have experienced long waiting times at the doctor's office beyond what you deem acceptable? <laughs> Quite many of you. So why do you think this happens? Is it because of bad scheduling? Is it because of overbooking? Is it because of variability involved in our patient processes? How about all of the above? So in the appointment scheduling problem, we address the question of how to manage patient arrivals in outpatient clinics so that we utilize resources efficiently and patients experience short waiting times. So what makes this problem challenging? Uh, one of the factors that make this problem challenging is its highly stochastic nature. So patient clinics have to deal with many sources of variability, including patient no-shows, non-punctuality, emergency walk-ins, stochastic demand for outpatient services, stochastic consultation times, patient heterogeneity, and the list goes on. Moreover, the underlying optimization problem is often a computationally complex one. So in this study, we model the appointment scheduling problem as an integer nonlinear mathematical program where the objective is the outcome of stochastic analysis in transient state. So the objective function is not given by an oracle, is the outcome of hard work, stochastic analysis in transient state. So in this skill optimization, it is very crucial to identify structures that guarantee the success of some optimization algorithm, either to exact optimality or to within some good approximation factor. So two such properties are L-convexity and multimodularity. Both properties guarantee that a local mean is a global mean, but the local neighborhoods look different. So this is an example of what the local neighborhoods look like in three dimensions. Uh, they look different, but they have the same size, and this size grows exponentially fast. So we have shown that the appointment scheduling problem possesses discrete convexity properties. Uh, we know that a local mean is a global mean, so we can solve the problem, but we also know that the size of the problem grows exponentially fast, which is problematic when it comes to solving large, meaningful instances of the optimization problem. So the question we pose is the following. Can we solve the problem in, poly in polynomial time? Can we solve this problem more efficiently? And the answer is yes. So in conclusion, uh, the appointment scheduling problem is highly stochastic in nature. It, it, it possesses discrete convexity properties. Our efficient optimization procedure allowed us to solve problems we are considered to be impossible to solve in the past and allowed us to gain some novel insights into appointment scheduling. Uh, we have shown that all sources of variability are important and should not be ignored, and that our patient clinics have to take measures to contain this variability in order to achieve their operational goals. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you.